Hello, a healthy day to all viewers of TVUP and Health Issues. I'm Dr. Teddy Herbosa, a trauma surgeon, an academic, and faculty of the College of Medicine of the University of the Philippines, Manila. From 2010 to 2015, the university lent me to the Department of Health as an undersecretary as we implemented health reforms for the Philippine health system. This educational series on health systems, health policies, and health reforms are critical as our country is aiming to provide health equity and quality health care to our citizens from all socioeconomic so sectors through a robust and efficient universal health coverage system that all governments aspire to attain. Our health system has long mirrored the health system in the United States of America, which has now become the most expensive healthcare system in the world. In the early 1990s, our government officials decided that we can no longer copy the American model of an expensive healthcare for a high income economy, but must develop our own system through one involving greater health equity for our poor and the disadvantaged. After our government decided to follow the Bismarck model of social protection and created the National Health Insurance Act of 1994, which eventually formed the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. It was also Health Secretary Alberto Quasi Romualdez that initiated health reform agenda in an environment of a decentralized health system that predated the creation of the National Health Insurance Program. By 2010, which was supposed to have been the deadline for universal health coverage by PhilHealth, only 54% of the population had health insurance. Also, the support value of PhilHealth remained a low 30% of the total cost of healthcare, making our citizens spend a ton of money from out-of-pocket expenses. It was in this environment that we formulated the Department of Health's program of Kalusugan Pangkalahatan, directly translated as Health for All, and we passed the financing by revising the SIN tax law that allocated 85% of revenues to healthcare system. This was a critical reform in health financing that fueled the resurgence of better health outcomes for our people. Recently, we have passed a comprehensive universal healthcare law and the office of the president is due to sign this. What our, our series would like to do is to discuss the many complex issues of health reform in our health system. For this episode, we have our first guest, former health secretary, Pauline Jean Rosel Obial, to help us understand one of the important elements of health reform, which is good governance together with health leadership. Pauline, let's start by talking about your life experience in the public health system. Let us uh, know how you ended up in the Department of Health uh, and eventually become the highest health official of the land and an alter ego of the president on matters about health. Well, uh, Ted, I started my career in public health as a rural practice volunteer um, after my internship at UPPGH. So we finished in May. I entered Kidapawan Health Center. Your that family is, in, is from Mindanao, right? That's it's North Cotabato. North Cotabato. Right? Um, August. Mm -hmm. So I worked there for six months. Volunteer, no salary. As a, a volunteer. So uh, I was able to see firsthand how a rural physician actually worked. We went to the mountains, we went to indigenous peoples. So you were Bagobos. a rural doctor. Yes. Rural doctor and a volunteer of the Department of yes, Health. Yes, that's right. So it was really um, a transition in my life, thinking about doing residency. But after the six months that I was in North Cotabato, I then decided that public health or rural practice is what I want to do so rather you fell, than... you fell in love with the yes. public health and rural practice. That's true. Mm -hmm. Rather than hospital or yeah. clinical practice. Which is my track. I ended <laughs> up in a hospital, yes. So after passing the board exam, um, I think the results came in February, and we ended our rural practice in March, I had an offer from the regional director of Region 12, to stay on. Davao region, right? No, that's uh, Cotabato. Cotabato, yes. Cotabato region. And uh, Maguindanao and some of the ARMM provinces were still part of Cotabato region. Correct, correct. So I stayed on 
as uh, maternal and child health program coordinator. And uh, during the time that I was there, I was again noticed by the city health, uh, uh, the mayor of Cotabato City, and he appointed me assistant city health officer. Okay. So, that, so that you moved from the Department from, of Health to from a the local government, office, from the regional office. I joined, at that time, we were not yet devolved. Uh, yes, yes. So it was still with the Department of Health, but working in the local government. Correct, union. correct, correct. So that was the time that I saw how really policy leadership, because I was at a leadership position yes. in the city health office, can really influence how the health system would So it's the, work. the city health officer is the pilot for how the local health system happens in the city, right? And coordinates with the, with the Department of Health yes, and the other all. agencies of government, yes. correct? And then you also have to coordinate with all the other like departments of the local government. You have to present the budget. You have to defend your budget correct, correct. in the Sangguniang. So it's like a mini national government. <laughs> So, so you learned governance yes. at an early, early part of your career. You are already learning governance and leadership in a small community. Community. And I think uh, my most uh, unforgettable experience as assistant city health officer of Cotabato City was when my mayor came back from a conference sponsored by UNICEF and he said, you know, uh, doctora, I don't want to go back to that conference anymore. Do you know we're the lowest in the entire country <laughs> in uh, fully immunized child? FIC. At, the, at that time, I didn't even know what FIC, FIC is. was. Yes, uh, this is a marker uh, for yeah. how many of the children in the community have full immunization full. of all the um, uh, vac vaccine-related diseases. Yeah, so uh, at that time, I didn't know. And I told him, I will make sure, Mayor, that we will not be the lowest before the end of the year. What was the rate at that time? Um, Must when, be less than 50%. When I came in, that was 1988, uh, our rate was 18, one Oh eight. my God. And the whole country was already at the 80% mark. So uh, I, I told the mayor, at least we will not be the lowest. So I did a lot of programs, we did campaigns, we did like, uh, uh, we health talked promotion. to the schools, health promotion, mm. we talked to Rotary. But we didn't call it health promotion then. Yeah, yes. <laughs> we called it public health. You know, Actually, health it education. was then called social mobilization. Social mobilization was so the old you, term. So you, you engage all the stakeholders, stakeholders and then you implement a program. So the good news was that after about six months doing that, we got 82% Wow, in six FIC. months. So did you do house to house or yes. they went to your health center? No, we did the campaign. Every first Saturday, they come to a, day. a health post. It's not the health center. We established so many health posts and we had uh, nurses, student nurses, student midwives, uh, uh, So you had an army as well. Yes. So you got all other stakeholders in the health community Involved. To have the idea, let's improve FIC yes. and vaccinate all the children. Interesting. So that's how governance can work and succeed. So that was six months huh? from 18% to 84%. Yes. Wow. That's why uh, I was t telling myself, because uh, that was my first experience. Little did I know that after five years, we would be doing the National Immunization Day with Secretary Flavier. With Secretary yes. Flavier. So with my background in Cotabato doing that mass vaccination campaign and catch up immunization, um, I was uh, prepared for the much bigging, bigger role of being the head of the Polio Eradication Unit. Oh, yeah. And I was the so one So you were involved staged. in that, in the uh, Polio Actually, we, we were on top of staging the whole... Uh, National Immunization Days campaign. We were sent by the DOH, me, Maritel, mm -hmm. Costales, and Agnes Benegas, the three of us, to Vietnam for the technical advisory group meeting on yes. Uh, polio eradication. You never told me this story when we were in the <laughs> Department of Health. We were seatmates in the Exegom. But uh, uh, polio is one of the examples of a successful partnership yes. between the private sector, the Rotary Clubs of the yes. world.
to eradicate polio, and we succeeded. When was when did the WHO declare that we were polio free? We were declared polio free in 2000. Actually, Secretary Romualdez was, then was Secretary. the one who accepted the award, award. in Japan wow. at that time. So indeed, public health has that, had had its successes. Yes. Oh, so how, how did and you nice. end up in central office? Or were you assigned in regional offices before? So in? after my success in Cotabato, I was already noticed by program managers of the central office. So they were saying, oh, there's a, a good doctor, a very good public uh, health, public uh, health uh, doctor in Cotabato. So and we can recruit her to the central tested, office. Uh, battle tested with medals. So they <laughs> recruited you to yes. the central office, I see. So your success in local governance mm -hmm. brought you to the central, the central office. office. How was life like in central office? I mean, you know, we're in central office. It's like, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you have many bosses. Yes. You don't have yes. only one boss. It's a matrix <laughs> organization. Yeah. Yes. You have a matrix there in central office. Mm -hmm. And many people, assistant secretaries, under secretaries, secretaries, secretaries directors. of health, even people from other agencies <laughs> yes, imposing their true. will on you. Yes. So how was that life like that in the central office? It was really um, more, much more busier in central office because in the field, you really can take your time or make your own schedule. But in central office, everybody is pulling you left and right. For and meetings then, and yes. for projects. Yeah. And then you cannot like make your own schedule because you have to adjust to the schedule of other the offices, the bosses, uh, your the programs, network, yeah. UNICEF, WHO. So it's really um, So crazy. it was a culture shock. Yes. It was a culture shock from rural medicine, mm -hmm. rural public health, to central office governance and leadership. Interesting. Yes. But um, I was also exposed to making policy. Uh -huh. Because at that, um, when I was city health officer, we were implementing programs. I had somebody write all the orders, the directive. In central office, because I was the program manager, I wrote administrative order, department yes. order, and all that. Correct, correct. So we're really very involved in central office Maybe, with maybe for the benefit of viewers, they should understand that laws in the Philippines can be created through Congress and yes. Senate as uh, Republic Acts. The president can act, the executive can issue executive in orders, orders, but the secretary of health can issue administrative, administrative orders, orders and department orders, yes. which will involve the whole health sector or the whole department of health or uh, any, any focus group for specific for, policies. Yes, that's so right. So you were involved in crafting many of the policies yes. written in the past. Mm -hmm. What is one you remember and you're proud of? It's uh, crafting the administrative order for the National Immunization Days. Ah, the one okay. that Flabier, Flabier used to, used, to yes. reach about 95%. 95%. That was the reach. most successful implementation or immunization program of the country. And I believe uh, the WHO used our model as yes. a pattern and became a case study for other countries to that's, improve immunization. That's true. After our national immunization days, actually, WHO was pushing us to be the first country in Western Pacific to do national immunization days because it was already being done yes. only in PAHO. Correct. In the South American... Uh, Latin America, Pan-American uh, Pan Health American. Organization. Yeah, but they did it in South America. North America, they didn't do uh, mass vaccination or national immunization days. So they were pushing us. And the biggest promoter there of the health day was Secretary Flavier yes. himself. He was and, um, with his jokes. We TV. were able to stage it successfully with Secretary Flavier, with all the logistical dilemma. At that time, um, we didn't have... We didn't even have the vaccines in the country. Oh. So we're, we're we, monitoring. We get it from WHO, yes. right? Oh, UNICEF, UNICEF and WHO. WHO. It's a global purchase. Mm -hmm. And then we just give their money and then they deliver yes, when right. our program will be, right? Mm -hmm. So it was really logistically a uh, nightmare for all of us. A big operation. It was yes. a big operation it requiring your leadership and governance. It was done in April and May 1993. So you're really a 
a local Philippine <laughs> expert, uh, in, in fact, a global expert on implementation of immunization yes. program. So after that, uh, that's when uh, the Philippines became uh, known in the Western Pacific as really a tra trailblazer in terms of mass vaccination campaigns, in terms of social mobilization. So we were invited to a meeting in Vietnam for the technical advisory group on polio eradication. Mm -hmm. And our main role there was to convince all the other countries of the Western Pacific to do it. That it was also doable to eradicate yes. polio in their country. And then when they saw our list of stakeholders and collaborators, I think we have around 45 and we had, uh, can I mention, private sector, yeah, okay. Jollibee, McDonald's. Okay, so the private sector also helped Coca -Cola, out. Coca-Cola, and they were all wondering, how did you get all this private sector to help you? Oh, we just asked them to print our posters, mm -hmm. to help deliver promotion. our materials like Coca-Cola trucks. They were all over the country. They were so in the So it was mountains. an early form of public-private partnership. Yes. Huh? As a, it wasn't called then at that time, public-private <laughs> partnership. Yes. But stakeholder engagement. Yes, you engage all stakeholders and were, was able to implement uh, polio eradication And program. then we had DHL, we had PAL. They delivered all our logistics for free. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so that was uh, how we were able to make it, despite a very low budget. Government only came out with the budget for the vaccines, but all the information, education materials were donated. Interesting. Yes. So and after that, well, it's, uh, the rest is history. history. Became assistant secretary. Because uh, secretary China, for... the biggest country in Western Pacific, actually did their national uh, immunization. immunization. I saw that and I said, oh. China is copying the Philippines. Yes. <laughs> so let me ask you now, based on your wealth of experience as a health leader, uh, understanding health governance and how to make immunization programs happen, how does the health reform occur in a particular health system? You've lived through a centralized uh, mm -hmm. health system, converted into a devolved, de devolved and decentralized, system. and then through the creation of PhilHealth, mm -hmm. through Kalusugam Pangkalahatan, then you became health secretary. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me a story. How does a country or a system, a government, implement reform in the health sector? I think um, I would like to believe that I went through in my 29 years in the Department of Health through the major upheavals. Three decades, uh, three decades uh, yes, of Department of Health. Of the health sector in the Philippines. So you did mention about PhilHealth, uh, the introduction of the Social National protection. Health Insurance Program. I think that was one of the, shall we say, turning point, tipping point of the health system in the Philippines because we changed the way we finance health. Yeah from a purely tax base, meaning Correct. we get taxes from people and then give it... We had a public uh, health, public health yes. and public hospital funded by tax money. Tax money. And then private health funded by right. out-of-pocket. Yes. So if you're poor, you go to the public <laughs> system. If so you're rich, it's you go a to dichotomous the, health system. The field yes. health covered everybody, yes. poor and rich. Okay. So it, it was a paradigm shift so that really... Uh, the, the intention was that people, even if you are poor, you can access health services Correct. in the private hospital. Even if you are rich because of the quality of health services in public hospitals, you can access Correct. health Correct. services. So we wanted a shift from a dichotomous health system to a um, Social protection. Single, 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 single payer. payer. Single payer. In fact, at that time that started, I remember my colleagues in clinical medicine was ignoring field health for the mm -hmm. very small yes. reimbursement. Uh -huh. But today, everybody is trying to, to line up and queue and get field health But uh, I think that was the way we started with uh, very low, shall we say, support, support value. value. But as things improve, then we increase uh, the support value. Correct. And right now, because um, as you mentioned, private sector is trying to get the national health insurance because we now have about 92% covered. About 90 million people yes. have uh, health insurance. So it's, insurance. it's actually now, in terms of volume, you can get more uh, payments if you get more patients. So it's more sustainable to deliver 
low cost but quality, quality health care. Okay. So that's uh, how we are. And I think uh, the turning point again was the syntax law. Yes, the financing. Because um, after that law, I think the, the funds for health increased, quadrupled. That's why when... You know, we only won that law by 10, 10 to 9. <laughs> By one vote. Yeah, by one by vote. By one vote. In fact, when Secretary Duque came in, uh, he was my health secretary before the first Secretary time, The first time, Ona, the first time. Yes. And then when he came in now as health secretary, when I left the DOH, he said, Pao, you are awash with cash. <laughs> because at, we uh, during, the during his time, it. the budget of the DOH and including PhilHealth, was $26 yeah, billion I, I in all. That. I saw that. And when I was endorsing to him the budget of the DOH and PhilHealth was already 160, 160 already? billion. Wow. So he was really uh, going crazy about the amount of money that was invested in health. And, and, and you know what happened? The absorptive capacity wasn't there. So DBM started to cut again. No, but so, uh, I, I, told, I told DBM at that time, you know, uh, health is an investment. Correct. And at that point in time when President Duterte came in, I, I'm very glad that he in fact mentioned it in his uh, State of the Nation address that uh, we, of course, when the president says something, it came from the health secretaries yeah. or the secretaries. Yes, yes, yes. But he mentioned and in then we, State of the Nation. we feed his uh, speech. speech writers. Uh, uh, and then he mentioned that health is an investment. Correct. It is not an expense. Therefore, we will, this administration will ensure Invested greater health. investments in health. So I, I was very glad that he did mention that. And I, in fact, lobbied for um, the biggest budget of health during my administration. In the history of the Philippines. Yes. In the history of the Philippines. Because uh, I was presenting to the president a um, health development plan that looked at an ideal model of human resource to population, of uh, health facilities to population. And we saw that there were 42,000 hospital beds. Correct. Gap. That's the that infrastructure time. gap yes. for hospitals, correct. And then I, he wanted, the president in his uh, campaign uh, wanted one barangay health station or one health worker per barangay. I told the president, we cannot do that because we don't even have a house. The barangay health station in every barangay. And he said, how, how many are we missing? I said, we have 42,000 barangays. We only have 21,000 barangay oh, health stations. That's why he Half. also invested. So um, in my total presentation, we needed 20, 228 billion. Mm -hmm. And the president said, oh, that's very easy. But sir, that's only capital outlay money. Oh, you need, you, need, you need human resource. Medicine. You need uh, operating expenses. Oh, but he says... If we have a house, and so the other things will come in, so let's build the house first. Correct. So I told him, sir, if you will continue on giving the Department of Health what we have been receiving in terms of capital outlay, then we will finish this in 11 years' time. Yeah, because long, we're, huh? we're receiving only about... Um, 20 billion a year. You know, that's what people don't understand, that that's what I learned. Money, you cannot just throw it and solve a problem. Yes. Because there is a certain level. The money needs to build health centers. Mm -hmm. The health centers need to be equipped with medicines mm -hmm. and people before they are able to provide actual services yes. to the mm -hmm. people and before health outcome changes. There's another interesting thing we need to talk about. The president sent you to Cuba. Yes, he did. To look at the health system there. And that's a, that's a universal health coverage uh, model of a socialist model. Can you tell us more about that trip? Yeah, you know, the president is a wide reader. I think he read somewhere or he read the book. But when he was interviewing me in Davao, he's, he asked me to go to Davao to be interviewed to interview, yeah. as health secretary. And even before he says, oh, you're my health secretary already, he just out of the blues tell me, Doctora, you go to Cuba. I, I told him, what am I going to do there, sir? 
You've oh, never you been to Cuba, no. but you've, we've, you've read about yeah, the read. successes of their health outcomes. Actually, it's very superficial, Ted. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know the deep uh, Yeah, The, the reports of WHO yes. that their health outcomes yes. are very good with yes. little expenditure. In, in fact, yeah. yes. So I, I didn't really know, but out of the blue, she said, go to Cuba. What will I do there, sir? I don't know <laughs> anybody. Obasa, you go to Cuba, you observe what they are doing Correct. because I think that's the health system that will work for the Philippines. Especially okay. for rural areas, right? I so uh, after that interview, I was uh, named the health secretary. So the first thing I did when I was in office was to arrange that trip, that trip to yeah. Cuba. So we went there in August. I, I came in in July. So you right? followed the marching orders of the president <laughs> yes. to look at the model, the health system model in Cuba. Cuba. So they have no private health care. No, That's what I no heard. private. Only government provides the health care. Yes. And uh, I think uh, it was really an eye-opener that their health system was really well organized. They observed the doctor to population ratio, the health uh, hospital bed to population ratio, and all oh. that. And then all their vaccines, all their No wonder they're are rated free, very high free. by WHO because they follow the parameters yes. that were measured. So In the fact, quality. they're even better. Yes, yes. They have so. one doctor for every 1,000 population. Their ratio, doctor to population ratio, is even better than the United, the United States. States. Correct. But their cost is so much less. They spend about $460 per capita. The Ooh. U.S., that's oh. why the you US mentioned the most they're expensive. most expensive. Correct. They're $8,600. $8, the Philippines, at that time I went there. What, what is the per what, capita? $135. Okay. So my mission then was to increase the budget, the investment in health, mm -hmm. to about $300. Okay. And we were able to achieve that oh, in 2017. That's wonderful. Huh? Yeah. So that's really part of financing it. Now, there are many projects in the Department of Health that we also run and you get into some problems or did not succeed very mm -hmm. well. Do you, mm -hmm. there are, are there programs in the past, in your experience, in your career mm -hmm. uh, in the government were in a public health program, didn't do so well, mm -hmm. and what lessons were learned from it? Uh, yes. Um, I think uh, one of the most important lessons is getting the money. It's just half solving half the problem. Mm. It's spending the money. Yes. Right? Yes. And the, government spending is not that easy. The <laughs> underutilization and all that. Because I think what, we're, we're try, what happened to us in the DOH was that we had... Um, like budgetary support, but we did not have technical support on how to actually uh, make our systems more efficient Correct. so that we will be able to utilize the funds that were given to us. Like, for example, uh, Secretary Duque was saying, oh, you get three times the budget, but you have three times less people because of re-engineering. Uh -huh. We were downsizing yes. for so many years during Secretary Ona, during uh, my time, and yet the budget was increasing. The number of people doing the job was decreasing. So the obstacles were really the framework of human resource matching with the program yes. and the funding, funding increase. Very difficult. Really, It's like a many gears in a box where yes. you control the gears. Mm -hmm. You, you increase the financing, but you lessen the people, the outcome is also no good. So it's very tricky. Mm -hmm. That's why um, one of the lessons I learned in the health sector was really, uh, Ted, to uh, make sure that you have a very good plan, right. like the kalusugang pangkalahatan, so that what happens in the next administration is actually... Uh, sustained or followed through. But, but you know, Kalusugan Pangkalatan was not our plan. Mm -hmm. It was your plan. It was the plan. I'm from outside the DOH. We yes. come in. It was a plan that you guys devised out of what, what had been happening. Yes. And we just implemented it because you said this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. We just steered and piloted the programs. Actually, that's, that's one of the things that the DOH is really 
um, I, I believe, more mature in, in terms of the other agencies of government. We develop strategic plans. Yes. 10 years, yes. even 20 years down the road. In fact, I like your continuation of KP. Yes. Your you continued with the SDNs. Yes. So you, you, you used what was done for financing, mm -hmm. and you tried to develop the SDN, and that's where the story of the more rural health centers yes. and more primary, primary care, care, which is also what you saw in... In Cuba, Cuba yes. because in Cuba, because they have more doctors, they, there was more primary care and there was less need of tertiary, That's expensive right. tertiary But you know, care. the bottom line, um, I think, of Cuban model, aside from the health facilities and human resource, is really the, the target of government is to have all Cubanos have annual checkup. Interesting, huh? Because it, so, it, it uh, can be a... So, health status check. So no, the, but... It doesn't have to be a sophisticated or high-tech checkup. It's just making sure that every citizen of the country is seen by a health professional. And I remember uh, a former president who used that as a mm -hmm. campaign slogan, <laughs> wherein half of the Filipinos that die didn't even see yeah, a doctor. A doctor, <laughs> yes. So, so that's, that's an important model that mm -hmm. the physicians must see the people mm -hmm. and that, that assessment in itself will, solve, will identify the problem and yes. solve that one. Very interesting. So what are your suggestions to how, now we have this universal healthcare law mm -hmm. that's about to be signed by our president and uh, uh, it's a very comprehensive law. I look at it, it's something that's very hard to do, very complex. <laughs> uh, the people that crafted it want to do everything all at one go, and what is your advice to the people do sitting you know, in government? Do you know that law was started during my time? Yeah, okay, you were crafting it, yeah. Yeah, but the, the original version, which uh, Congressman Harry Roque submitted to me, was actually not so acceptable. Yes, That's from, why we reformed it. And um, we, we put in all the problems that's why Menchit was saying that the law for newborn screening was actually trying to solve the existing problems at that uh, Chancellor point Padilla in time. Chancellor Padilla of yeah. UP Manila Menchit. has a program on uh, <laughs> newborn, screening. newborn screening that was passed into law. law. But uh, at that time, they were competing with other health issues health because issues. of the low health budget yes. at that time. But uh, I think uh, that's why when you look at the universal health care law, it's um, so much input on various issues like regulations, the um, uh, human resource, the financing and all that. Because we looked at the health system or the health issues at this point in time and we tried to address mm -hmm. all the health issues through the law. And hopefully, of the Philippines? Yes. So you made it appropriate from a... Yes. I, I know it's when I saw the draft context. bill of uh, Congressman Rock at that time, it was it's a copy-paste from, from some Thailand. other... <laughs> Thailand. Yeah, I, we know we came from, because we, we understand where it came from. Yeah. But Thailand had a different yes. background and setting of where they are. And they're a multi-payer system. Yes. We have a single-payer single system, payer. which is one of the few in the world. Mm -hmm. I think we have only about nine countries with mm -hmm. a single-payer. And it's actually an advantage for us. Yes. So... I'll ask with, uh, with a few remaining minutes and with all the experience you have shared with me in this episode, I'd like to ask you now uh, all the things you've learned about universal healthcare implementation and the, the big role of good leadership, strong leadership, and good governance. I, I, I think people forget that. They think it's a framework of a law. I believe it's very important the plane will not fly on its own. Yes. It needs a yeah, pilot. A pilot. It needs a good pilot, pilot. and a good navigator. Yes. The two of them have to work together. Mm -hmm. So explain to me how, how important this pillar of good governance and good leadership is. Yes, I, I, I think that's why we really need to have a multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder uh, approach to health. It's not just one person or one agency doing it, mm -hmm. like the Department of Health. It has to be all the stakeholders working together. And what's very important is the, the leadership role has to have that um, ascendancy or 
uh, values that is espoused by all the stakeholders so that you can actually lead them. Because if your values are not aligned with your stakeholders, then you will not have uh, teamwork. So you're telling me to health, si health systems strengthening and health systems reform is a team sport. Yes. You need a team captain. Yes. You need a coach. <laughs> and everybody must know wh what their role is. is they, are they the goalie? Are they the forward? Are they the... Yes. Uh, so everybody must perform their role. That's uh, right. More like a That's conductor. Conductor. A conductor in a Maybe. symphony creating harmony. Orchestrating the music. And that's why our um, basic institutions like the academe, like uh, UP and all the medical schools must actually work with government so that we produce the leaders, the health workers that actually espouse the values that we want to happen in this country. And if you're a leader, you must also know the system. Yes. You must know the... Uh, we, how we have to be aligned. Aligned. If yes. you're running a, an airplane, you must know what the engine can do, mm -hmm. what the knobs are that you, you will turn. That's so. why the academy is important. And then I think NGOs are also important because they actually look at the entire picture and they fill in the gaps. I like in that the answer. System. Because the government cannot yes. provide everything. Yes, so that's sometimes, true. because you're busy addressing several issues, there are gaps left behind. Yes. And the private sector is allowed to actually fill in those yes. gaps. But the basic uh, framework or backbone, really, Ted, is uh, health reform agenda or a strategic plan so that all your stakeholders will have one vision, one goal, one framework, one, framework, one platform, one direction, one direction to move into. That's why the leadership role of the Department of Health is very important. And it's critical. And I critical. love that. Yes. Uh, well, with that note, I'd like to uh, ask you to give your final words, maybe to our leadership and the future leadership, we're having elections, and then in another three years, we'll change again government. There's talk about federal form of government. Mm -hmm. uh, again, with all these uh, distractions, we need uh, to give advice to the government, and both of us now are <laughs> not outside that health system, yes. but we can continue to give advice. Mm -hmm. So I'm giving you the, the YouTube, the internet, <laughs> for people to understand and uh, share your experience and expertise. Yes, um, I think as a country, we have to really work together so that we elect the kinds of leader that espouse the values that we have. Values of good governance, values of transparency, accountability, and, um, um, well, no to corruption, no to graft, and really helping our people uh, especially the poor and the marginalized. So um, let us elect the leaders that will move this country towards a better health um, system for us all. And if we elect the right leaders, they make the right laws, they allocate the right budget, because everybody says their priority is health, but they actually don't put the money uh, in the health sector, or they don't support the health sector, but they always say when they campaign, their priority is health. So I think we have to be critical as a people to really elect political leaders that will support our values and our agenda, health agenda, which is universal health coverage. Thank you very much, Pao. Well, that's our final message for today. With this episode, we saw many things that uh, our experienced guest was able to share with us. Talked about the importance of good, uh, good governance and uh, good health leadership to implement reforms in the health system, to strengthen our health systems. She talked about making the health system similar to a team sport, wherein uh, the leader will be conducting and creating all the necessary efforts and all stakeholders will be involved in taking care of attaining better health outcomes for the people. Well, Pao, yeah. thank you very much. And to all our viewers, thank you very much for covering this episode. Uh, a healthy session to all of you. And watch out for more, more episodes in health issues. Thank you.